Israel said that it wants to dismantle the Hamas regime, that by the end of this war, a war that Israel didn't start and didn't even expect, but was dragged into, Hamas in Gaza will be no longer, not as a governing body, not as a military wing, uh, because the, the Israeli nation has decided that it can no longer live next to an existential genocidal threat called Hamas. So this is the only reason why the IDF is operating in Gaza right now. Good evening and welcome to the Rosenberg Report. The ground invasion of Gaza has begun. Uh, just a little over 24 hours ago, Israeli forces, uh, sea, air and land, began moving uh, deep into uh, the northern Gaza region, particularly focused on Gaza City, which is the base camp, the main center of operations uh, for uh, the Hamas terror operation. In fact, Israeli intelligence released on Friday, just a few hours before the invasion began, uh, conclusive evidence that uh, the main command and control center for the Hamas terror organization is under uh, a major hospital in Gaza City uh, called Shifa Hospital. It was uh, a chilling uh, evidence, but but reinforced what most Israelis have have uh, in expected or sensed for a long time that Hamas has burrowed under hospitals, schools, uh, uh, medical centers, uh, play you know uh, 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 children's uh, centers, uh, all designed to keep Israel from attacking those positions. Now, of course, uh, Israel hasn't attack attacked uh, Shifa Hospital, but it is moved decisively after three weeks of people wondering when is Israel going to go fully on offense, not just from the air. When is Israel going to move on the ground? It began on Friday night. Uh, the IDF spokesman uh, began laying out uh, some of the objectives. Of course, it's the complete eradication of, uh, of Hamas and, and all of its allies, their, their terror operations, their military capacity. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk to um, a spokesman, a spokeswoman uh, for Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. She happens to be uh, a former senior correspondent for All Israel News and the producer of the Rosenberg Report. But on October 7th, that horrific day in which Hamas invaded uh, southern Israel and, and slaughtered more than 1,300 Israeli Jews, defenseless Israeli uh, citizens, um, Tal Heinrich was, uh, uh, received a phone call from uh, the prime minister's office here in Israel saying that they had bought a ticket for her to be on a plane to come back to Israel immediately for her to leave her current, her, her, you know, her past positions with me and start uh, serving as a spokesman uh, for the prime minister. So we'll talk to her in just a moment. But I want to update you on more of what's happened in just these last 24 hours. There have been some successes. So uh, uh, the IDF has confirmed that two senior Hamas commanders, very critical commanders to the Hamas terror efforts have been taken out, have been killed by uh, Israeli operations. Uh, the first is Isam Abu Rukba. He was in charge of all of Hamas's air assets, meaning uh, the drones, uh, the paragliders that took Hamas terrorists into uh, southern uh, Israel the other day and all the other uh, air assets that Hamas has, that leader, uh, Isam Abu Rukba, has been killed uh, by the IDF here in the last uh, 24 hours. The second senior commander, also very important, uh, Rateb Abu Sahiban. He was in charge of all of Hamas's uh, naval assets, including uh, efforts to attack Israel from the sea. Uh, some of those attacks were foiled um, on October 7th and the days that followed uh, by uh, uh, Israel's own uh, Navy SEALs operation, Shayet uh, Shalosh Ray Shayet 13. Uh, but both of those senior commanders have been taken out. Uh, Israel is not only attacked with a massive bombardment, I mean, the biggest probably that uh, we've ever seen in the history of the Israel-Hamas uh, 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 wars over the years, the biggest bombardment of northern Gaza that we've ever seen. Uh, the defense minister said the ground shook, and it certainly did. But it wasn't just that. Attacks uh, by Israel from the sea, but particularly Israeli tanks moving into the Gaza Strip and attacking Hamas positions. Now, as that attack and, and invasion has now begun uh, from the north, one that we've been waiting on for several weeks, um, Hezbollah, the Iranian terror proxy force in Lebanon, has opened up and intensified their attacks against Israeli military, 
and civilian uh, positions in the North. You'll see from a, a moment uh, an actual NBC News uh, graphic that shows uh, all the different places that Hezbollah has attacked Israel along the Israel-Lebanon border in the last uh, 24 hours. And so that has really escalated uh, and, and raises the question, uh, should Israel just go full on, not just respond to the specific units that are attacking uh, Israel from Lebanon, the Hezbollah units, but should Israel either A, invade or launch a massive aerial bombardment of all Hezbollah positions? And see, this is one of the big issues. And Thursday night on the Rosenberg Report, we did a big special um, in which I spent the day on that Lebanon-Israel border talking to experts. And they're saying to me, listen, if we win in Gaza, which we will, and we leave Hezbollah in place with its 150,000 to 200,000 missiles aimed at Israel, and we leave Iran's regime with, a, uh, with 84% enrichment of uranium, when they only need to get to 90 to 93% enrichment of uranium to produce full-blown, fully operational nuclear warheads, uh, every single Israeli I talk to, and you'll see it on the show, uh, say, well, what's the point? We win in Gaza, but we are facing an even, even bigger and more existential murder threats uh, from the north, from Iran and from Hezbollah in Lebanon. So those are very serious issues, and I encourage you to go to rosenbergreport.tv, uh, and uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. Both places have the full show from Thursday night, and I encourage you to watch it. Normally, we would have replayed that here, but uh, we decided because of this invasion, we had to do the special report tonight here, Saturday night, uh, um, on what's happening with this invasion. Now, uh, there are other developments. Uh, President Biden, uh, ordered two airstrikes, U.S. airstrikes, in Syria against Iranian positions, particularly bases uh, controlled by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. Biden ordered airstrikes on two of those Iranian IRGC positions. Why? Because the Iranian uh, uh, terrorists uh, based in Syria have launched a series of attacks on U.S., American uh, 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 military forces in Syria and Iraq. This has led to 21 um, American casualties, not deaths, but, uh, but definitely uh, injuries, and Biden decided to attack Iranian positions. This is a significant escalation uh, because it, it suggests, that I mean, it doesn't suggest, for the first time, Biden has taken on the Iranian uh, terrorists. Uh, he, the, the Pentagon and the White House are saying this is separate from Israel's war uh, with, uh, with Hamas and Gaza, but it's happening simultaneously. And so we haven't seen the U.S. move this way uh, since this war uh, began. Also, President Biden ordering another air, U.S. aircraft carrier strike group, this time not to the eastern Mediterranean, where there are two carrier strike groups present now, but he ordered this one, the USS, USS Roosevelt, to move towards the Persian Gulf, getting ready again to project force in case the president decides uh, the United States has to engage in direct attacks against Iran. Uh, this, is a, this is a significant development. Now, uh, a few other things, and then we're going to go to our interview in a few moments with Tal Heinrich, but the UN Secretary General condemning Israel, accusing us of war crimes, and calling for a ceasefire. Also, the UN General Assembly passing, listen to this, a resolution condemning Israel and not condemning uh, Hamas, and yet calling for a ceasefire when we're still under attack, uh, more than 8,100 uh, rocket attacks. And we're going to talk about Russia and why it's in in inviting Hamas and Iranian officials to Moscow. We'll talk about that when we come back. I want to welcome to the Rosenberg Report uh, my previous colleague. She was a senior correspondent for All Israel News and the producer of the Rosenberg Report. I did an interview with her last week uh, to sort of profile how did she get from working for us to working for the prime minister as a spokesman. But I want to dive in right here with you, Ta. We'll let people look at that story, um, but we've got to get into the the, the ground invasion uh, that has actually started now. So let's begin with what are the, Israel's objectives in Gaza with this air, sea, and land invasion now? 
So, Joel, great to see you. The goal is very clear. Israel said that it wants to dismantle the Hamas regime, that by the end of this war, a war that Israel didn't start and didn't even expect, but was dragged into, Hamas in Gaza will be no longer, not as a governing body, not as a military wing, uh, because the, the Israeli nation has decided that it can no longer live next to an existential genocidal threat called Hamas. So this is the only reason why the IDF is operating in Gaza right now. And uh, as you know, uh, also here in Israel on the home front, the war continues. Israel has um, suffered more than 8,100 rockets being mm -hmm. constantly fired right, right. Uh, for what, 22 days now since the, the outbreak of, of this war. So it's uh, the October 7th massacre is what dragged us into this war, what made us launch the counteroffensive to defeat Hamas, but the war is uh, ongoing. One of the biggest questions and one of the most often questions uh, that I'm getting and I, and I need to ask you is, why three weeks until an actual uh, ground, major ground operation, not even an operation, the prime minister's calling it full on war. So you can call uh, what we're doing now in Gaza stage two or stage 1.5 of the operation to dismantle Hamas. Um, the Israeli government and the military leadership uh, they look at all kind of different variables as they make the very calculated decisions of how to act in Gaza, how to shape the military strategy moving ahead. For obvious reasons, these, uh, this is the kind of information that I cannot talk to you about. Sure. It would be very irresponsible on my behalf, but um, be sure that these decisions are very, very calculated. And Israel said that once it will further act in Gaza, it will be judiciously and it will be very, it will be decisive uh, because the goal, again, is, is a just goal and it's a clear goal mm. as we uh, defined it. So one of those reasons, of course, is that the prime minister and the top military leadership of Israel has been urging Palestinians in the north and around Gaza City, which is the, really the base camp for uh, the Hamas operations, to move south. Do you guys have an estimate at this point of how many Palestinians have heeded that call? But also, would you help us understand, confirm whether it's really true that, that uh, escape routes have been blocked and the Hamas, uh, there's been reports that they've been urging people to stay put. So these reports, unfortunately, Joel, are true because uh, just this week, by the way, uh, the IDF spokesperson unit released a phone call that was intercepted between um, uh, one of the IDF officers calling a, a northern Gaza resident, uh, telling them to uh, please evacuate. We keep urging the citizens there to evacuate. And uh, the, the, that person, the Gazan resident, was telling him, well, we cannot because Hamas had set up roadblocks. And the IDF officer is asking, well, how? How are they blocking the road? He said, with cars. And when, when he pushes them further, he says, well, they're shooting people. So they, they're not allowing uh, uh, civilian population to evacuate. But to your earlier question, many uh, northern Gaza residents have evacuated to uh, the area in the south in the south uh, where uh, we have designated that this place is a safer haven where humanitarian aid, uh, food supplies, water, and uh, medical supplies are awaiting. So many have heeded this call. We are hearing public reports of more than 600,000, but I don't know if you have an actual hard estimate. I don't have a, a hard estimate. I can check okay. it though. But humanitarian relief is coming in through the Rafah border through Egypt, correct? That is correct. What we said is that we will not prevent the transfer of uh, essential supplies from the Rafah border crossing from Egypt. We said that no aid will enter Gaza from uh, from Israel as long as the hostages are still there. But from Egypt, yes. And and just uh, to uh, make uh, Joel one thing uh, clear, because it's, it is important that audiences will understand that not only that Gazan population from the northern strip is evacuating to the south, also Israel itself had asked its own civilians to evacuate from northern Israel and from southern Israel. Mm -hmm. We have over 200,000 Israelis who have evacuated wow. because we don't want to have civilians in harm's way as we operate. Yeah. How many uh, hostages are now confirmed being held, uh, Israeli hostages, including some dual citizens and even some other uh, nationality? How many is that at this point? The number now stands at 229. Okay, wow. And four have been released. Is there, is there any hope at this point? Are there any prospects? What are you hearing about the possibility of getting more out? 
We always hope, Joel. We we can't lose hope, definitely. But um, you see, Hamas is a murderous terrorist regime. We are calling on them to un unconditionally and immediately release all hostages. But the reason why they release the four other uh, hostages is because of mounting international pressure. Pressure is working and more pressure is coming their way. Is there a risk, as some people are saying, that the ground operation is going to cut off any possibility of getting those hostages back free and, and put their lives in danger. Well, ground activity in Gaza is not only uh, in order to dismantle Hamas, we also have defined the return of the hostages as, as the goal of the ground mm -hmm. operation. Okay. Now, let me shift to sort of a broader geopolitical uh, examination of what's happening. Some uh, Several critical things have happened in, in the last 48 hours. First, Russia has invited senior Hamas leaders and Iranian senior leaders to Moscow. What is Israel's reaction to Moscow hosting the, the, the very perpetrators of this genocidal attacks? Well, we most certainly condemn this invitation uh, of the Hamas leadership to Russia. Um, this is uh, giving some legitimacy to terrorists. Uh, Hamas are terrorists. Joel, we have a siren going off here. We'll have to cut this interview and come oh back to you. Oh, my goodness. Michigan. All right. Be safe. Wow. As we continue, uh, Tal Heinrich, our uh, former senior correspondent and producer for uh, for All Israel News uh, and producer for the Rosenberg Report, now moving to a secure location inside uh, Israel's defense ministry. And uh, this is uh, just one more evidence of a barrage of attacks. This is why Israel cannot accept a ceasefire uh, that is being called by many nations, including the UN uh, Security, uh, or not the Security Council, but the UN General Assembly. But this is, this is insane. We are under attack right now. You are, you are watching it as I'm talking, I was talking to Tal Heinrich, who's now a spokeswoman for Prime Minister Netanyahu. And, uh, and this is why Israel cannot shut down uh, its military operations inside Gaza, because as she, Natal mentioned, uh, we've been subject to more than 8,100 uh, rocket attacks and more are inbound to Tel Aviv and central Israel and southern Israel as we speak. But I want to spend a few minutes in the closing portion of the show talking about the prophetic implications of what we're watching right now. I, I want to start by cautioning. It's, there's not enough data to say that this is, you know, Ezekiel 38 and 39, or this is uh, some other specific prophecy. But I do want to highlight a few things that are happening right now, some of which we've already talked about on the show, but just underscore them with a yellow highlighter, as it were, and then talk about uh, what almost everybody that I talk to these days by, by in, in personal conversations here in Israel or, or by text, email, whatever, this is what they're asking me. So I want to spend some time on the show tonight talking about it. So, so first we'll talk about the fact that in the first days uh, of October 7th and beyond, we got a lot of sympathy, right? More than 1,300 and then eventually 1,400 Israelis had been slaughtered, murdered in cold blood by this genocidal terrorist organization, Hamas. A lot of sympathy. But that is shifting. We've talked about uh, on the show and at All Israel News about uh, the media war against us, beginning to blame us for war crimes and so forth. But now we're seeing major world leaders turning against us. It starts with the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Guterres has said this week, just in recent days, he accused Israel of war crimes by defending ourselves, fighting in Gaza against this Hamas terrorist organization. He accused us of war crimes. Uh, he said he was going to, he condemned Hamas unequivocally, and then he equivocated. Then he started condemning us. And he said, oh, you know, this Israel's, uh, uh, the attacks by Hamas on Israel didn't happen in a vacuum. And he began to try to explain it away. The UN, and, and for that, he should be he should be fired or he should resign immediately. I wrote a column about that for All Israel News. This is reprehensible. It's vile. That's not the role of the UN Secretary General to put Israel, a country that's been attacked mercilessly, uh, in a position where people think that we're the victim of war crimes. We are not. Next, um, the UN General Assembly, th just in recent hours, has passed a resolution condemning Israel and not condemning Hamas. OK, that is just absolutely sickening. But it's but it's but it's the anti-Semitic, anti-Israel flavor 
that's out there. And, is, and we've shifted from sympathy uh, to this. And it's disgusting. And I think we're going to see more of it. I warned you at the beginning this would happen. And now it is happening. The next thing, uh, and I talked to Tal Heinrich a little bit before she had to uh, go to a safe room because of the rocket attacks. Russia's leaders, Russian leader Vladimir Putin, uh, inviting senior Iranian officials and Hamas leaders to Moscow and then sending Russia's foreign ministry to Iran. Look, this is the exact time that any normal nation would be cutting relations with the Iranian terror masters in Tehran and, and shunning and completely isolating Hamas. That's not what Vladimir Putin is doing. And let's just make this point. It's simple, but it's important for you to, to see it and process it. The only two governments in the world right now who are directly or through their terror proxies slaughtering, have invaded a sovereign democracies and are slaughtering people en masse are Russia under Vladimir Putin slaughtering and invading in Ukraine and the Iranian regime using its terror proxy forces in Gaza, Hamas, Lebanon, Hezbollah, and Yemen, uh, with the Houthis all attacking Israel in the last three weeks. And now Iran attacking American bases, American soldiers in Syria and Iraq. This cannot stand. And, uh, you know, as you'll see, I, I encourage you to go to RosenbergReport.tv and the YouTube channel to watch Thursday's show. As you'll hear experts uh, up in the north, on that northern border with Lebanon, say if Israel wins against um uh, Gaza, uh, Hamas in Gaza, but basically doesn't have a massive and decisive victory against Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Iran nuclear forces uh, and mil uh, missile forces in Iran. What's the point? We're actually under more of a threat than we are even from from Gaza. So what are the what are the prophetic implications? I want to just say this briefly, and then we'll get into it more in coming shows. Here's the thing. Um, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that Israel is going to, of course, continue to invade Gaza and defeat decisively Hamas. And then we're, you know, and maybe simultaneously that Israel's leadership will attack Iran's nuclear facilities and bombard and completely obliterate the Hezbollah threat of 150,000 to 200,000 missiles in Lebanon aimed at Israel. If that happens, a major, sweeping, decisive victory against Iran and its uh, terror tentacles, this would make Israel the absolute definitive um, uh, superpower in the Middle East. And as we clear out of the wreckage, it would mean that Israel would be the most powerful, secure, and increasingly prosperous country in the region. That's, that would sort of set the stage for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen someplace down the road. But there's another possibility that we're fighting in Gaza, but then Israel, Israel's leadership becomes paralyzed. That Hamas and Iranian leaders uh, persuade Putin to it, it become part of this attack and, and send Russian forces down uh, to uh, Israel at, at our borders and come to attack us. If that happens, I'm not saying it will, but if it happens, this would very likely be the beginnings of Ezekiel 38 and 39. We don't know right now. So we need to pray. We need to give financially to the Joshua Fund, our humanitarian relief organization that works right here in Israel. Uh, to all Israel News and TBN as we provide uh, honest, fair, and, 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 and accurate coverage by Christians from a biblical worldview. I encourage you to do that. And just keep praying for victory for Israel and peace and compassion on people suffering on both sides. That is the Rosenberg Report tonight. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless you and your family as you stand with Israel. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see you next week right here on the Rosenberg Report.